How's it going, everybody? It's Rosie here for Astrophysography. On the 9th of March 2019, in the town of Ketrin, there was the Practical Astronomy Show. And at that show, there were several talks, and I was fortunate enough to be allowed to record two of them. The following talk was presented by Damien Peach, who is a well-known lunar and planetary imager. He specializes in high-resolution imaging, and in this talk he tells you how to get the very most out of your instrument and how to get prepared for taking such high-detail photos. He has tips and tricks and software suggestions for all experience levels. A little minor hiccup with, this, with the camera, where the very start of the image, is, the very start of the talk is lost, but it was just a bit of introduction, so I'm very sorry about that. No information was lost. So without further ado, I'll let Damien take it from here, and I hope you enjoy it. See you later. When I say high resolution astrophotography, what exactly do I mean? Um, what, we do, what we're talking about when we say high resolution is primarily photography of the planets, so the sun, moon, and planets. And this is an area of astrophotography that I've been active in now for a very long time, and over the course of the talk, I'm going to be giving lots of advice on how to get involved in doing this. Um, it's one area of astrophotography where you don't actually need to make a, a big outlay in terms of money to, to actually start getting some surprisingly good images. And, and that's one of the really attractive things about going into photographing the, uh, the moon and planets with amateur telescopes. So, first of all, um, just to cover some theoretical considerations. Obviously, the bigger the telescope, the finer the detail it can resolve on planetary objects. So you can see here an example between Saturn with a 40 centimetre and a 10 centimetre telescope. And obviously there's quite a significant difference in the amount of detail visible. Up here you can see some star images from telescopes of different sizes, and you can see the airy disk produced by a telescope becomes smaller with uh, increasing aperture. So obviously a larger telescope can resolve finer detail uh, on planetary targets than a smaller one. But of course it's not just a case of how large a telescope is, it's also a case of dealing with atmospheric seeing, which is something I'll talk in more detail about later in the talk. But you can see here the effects of atmospheric turbulence imparted into images. So again here we have at top uh, with zero turbulence, so if you were in space, uh, obviously it would be uh, perfect. And as the turbulence becomes greater, you can see the image slowly becomes degraded by atmospheric turbulence. And turbulence is probably the number one limiting factor in the quality of images that we can get from ground-based telescopes. And just to illustrate, again, you can see here, uh, with zero turbulence, and here with only a very tiny amount of turbulence added to the image. But you can see, even with very small amounts of atmospheric turbulence, it, it starts to degrade the very fine planetary detail that we're looking to capture. So one obvious question to start with is, what is the best telescope to use for high resolution imaging? Well, I think perhaps the most important consideration ab above all which I've always said in talks, is choosing something that you can use easily and frequently. It's, it's very, uh, very easy to just buy a really large telescope that's cumbersome, and difficult to use, but you know, if you have to set that up each time, it can be a real enthusiasm killer, so that's something to consider. But generally, the best images, uh, the best planetary images taken today by amateurs are with reflecting telescopes, so either schmidt cassegrains or Newtonians, because we can get those in large apertures at affordable prices. That, that's really the key. I think if you're just starting out, perhaps a refractor is a good, good starting point because they're very easy to, to start using. Um, you don't have to consider things like collimation, etc. But you can see I've noted some various points up here. And as I say, the type of telescope, it, it's not really so important. Just uh, choosing something you can use easily and frequently. I think that's really the key to maintaining um, enthusiasm. And, I, and as I say, with modern cameras, software technology, um, it, even a six-inch telescope can get surprisingly detailed images of the planets. These are the two telescopes that I've used uh, uh, over the years. 
and th this one here uh, I've owned since 2005 uh, and I've used that primarily for overseas observing uh, of the planets and, th and this one here I've used here a home in the UK and these are two Celestron C14 Schmidt Cassegrain telescopes. So another important consideration when it comes to high resolution imaging is collimation and that is during the optical elements of the telescope are properly aligned. Now if you're using a Newtonian or Schmidt Cassegrain reflecting telescope this is absolutely crucial um, that you collimate the telescope and not only collimate it but check the collimation regularly. So you can see here just a basic guide to collimating and basically you use an out of focus star that's well placed above the horizon say 45 50 degrees and this shows a star defocused by varying degrees. So here's a low power view, defocused, and what you'll see through a reflecting telescope is a bright ring with a hole in the middle, and it should look concentric. If it isn't, the dark hole is offset to one side, the telescope collimation will need adjusting. And you move to stage two thereafter, a higher power view, so you increase the magnification, defocus the image less, and this will allow you to see misalignment that wasn't visible in stage one. So you always need to examine the collimation of a telescope at high magnification. And again, you'll, you'll see a pattern of uh, rings with a central dot. It should look like a bullseye. If it's offset again to one side like that, you need to make adjustments using the, the collimation adjustments of, of the telescope, either on the secondary mirror or the primary, depending on what type of telescope you're using. And the third stage is a high power in focus evaluation of a star. So it should look like a, a bullseye in good seeing conditions at high magnification. And this process of collimating is something that is really essential, not only for obtaining detailed images of the moon and planets, but for getting the maximum level of performance out of any telescope. It has to be collimated. So just some more tips on collimating. Obviously taking your time uh, is important. Using a star well above the horizon is also important to help uh, improve the seeing. So really at least 45 degrees. If using a Schmidt Cassegrain, also consider that swapping on, if the telescope is mounted on a German equatorial mount and you switch from one side of the mount to the other, result, resulting in a large positional change of the tube, that can cause the telescope to lose collimation. So this is something to, to keep in mind. Obviously using high power to examine stars and typically with my own 14 telescopes I use around 400 times and it's something I will check periodically every time I go out to use the telescope. So not just checking it once and then maybe again in six months, it needs to be something that's checked regularly. You can also use a camera, plugs in, so you could take the eyepiece out, plug a camera in and use a camera to um, look at the collimation of the telescope. And if you, if you want to do it this way, and that works really well, because obviously you can examine the star image on the monitor while you're making the adjustments, using a red or near infrared filter can help improve the view uh, as longer wavelengths are less affected by atmospheric turbulence. Now, discussing uh, a, another particularly important issue uh, when it comes to telescopes and high resolution imaging, and that's cooling and thermal considerations. So, what do I mean when I talk about that? Well, a telescope to perform near its limits has to be at thermal equilibrium with the surrounding air. So if you're bringing a telescope from inside into an outdoor environment where the temperature is considerably lower, it's going to take time to equalize with the, with the surrounding air. And if the, t if, the temperatures are, if the telescope is much warmer than the surrounding air, you'll see all kinds of strange effects in the star pattern of the telescope. So you can see here some real images taken with telescopes showing strange distortions in the outer focus star images. And this is caused by internal turbulence inside the telescope, so air of different temperatures mixing. And telescopes that are not cooled properly can, will not produce good quality images. Uh, so something very, very important to, to consider, particularly for high resolution imaging where you're trying to really get the most out of the telescope. It needs to be cooled down properly. So for any telescope, give it at least a couple of hours outside to cool down. Um, larger telescopes really need to be kept outside permanently. So 
12, 14, 16 inch telescope should really be kept outside permanently. But things in the eight to, eight to, 10, in, eight to 10 inch aperture range, you're looking at maybe a two to three hours of leaving the telescope to cool down if you're bringing it from indoors. So always leave the telescope plenty of time to cool before using it. And this just shows you uh, an image of a star in a telescope that's not properly cooled down. And you can see all kinds of weird distortions, slow moving distortions in the pattern. And this is the result of the telescope just simply not being at thermal equilibrium with the surrounding air. So it, it can really degrade the image quality considerably. So just to recap on, the, on uh, cooling and thermal issues, so you don't overlook these. They're, they're really, really important if you want to get the most out of your telescope. Obviously, larger telescopes take longer to cool down. And as I mentioned, large apertures really should live outside permanently. Some designs are obviously better than others, um, depending on the amount of glass they, they contain. So large aperture Max Sutoff designs are, are really unsuitable uh, because in large sizes, they basically never reach thermal equilibrium. As I mentioned, larger scope really will, will take longer to cool. And there, are active, there, there is an active approach you can take to cooling. Um, so one method that I've used for using my C14 telescopes in the, in the evening time, when the planets are visible in the evening springtime sky, when often the temperature drops and I want to use the telescope uh, immediately after sunset, I'll take the telescope tube off the mount keep it in a sheltered location where uh, it's out of the sun, put some ice packs on the telescope and just leave the telescope there all day. And then I will remount the telescope in the evening. And this makes an enormous difference to the quality of the image the telescope produces. Had I have just left it uh, up during the day to warm up, um, the difference between the image quality uh, with a telescope that's properly cooled and one that isn't it is enormous. And this image of Jupiter you see here was taken um, from my home site uh, down on the south coast in uh, April 2015. And this was done using the C14 telescope described in just the method uh, I've mentioned by carefully cooling the optical tube assembly during the day and then remounting it uh, and was able to take a, a really detailed image of Jupiter uh, uh, at sunset. Now just to move on a bit, we have cameras. And we're fortunate today, we have a whole range of imaging cameras available. And we, with high resolution imaging, they're, they're quite different to you, what your conventional sense of a camera might be in that is, they're not really like digital SLRs. What we're talking about here is high speed video cameras operated via a USB cable plugged into a computer. And these basically take the place of the eyepiece of the telescope. And there are various manufacturers. And as I mentioned here, uh, you can get color or mono versions, and they all basically shoot high-speed video sequences. Um, another consideration when it comes to uh, high-resolution imaging is focusing, and this is something that people, uh, I've probably had more questions on focusing than anything else, because people uh, really seem to struggle with it. And one, one of the best things you can do for focusing is to invest in a good focusing a good quality focuser for the telescope. So not using the manual focus of the telescope to focus. Um, it's woefully inadequate for doing this kind of photography. Um, you need to invest in a focusing system that allows you to move the focus of the telescope without having to physically touch the telescope. And that's what this device is here that you see. Uh, so this mounts onto the rear of the telescope and you have a handset which will move the draw tube of, of the focuser in and out by a very small amount. It allows you to focus the telescope very carefully. So if you don't have one of those, it's well worth investing in uh, a good focuser for your telescope. And I've just noted some other points that you can see here, as, we, as I've just discussed, investing in a good focuser. Don't use these focusing masks for planetary imaging. Um, it, it's just not practical because you're constantly focusing and refocusing throughout the night. And, and to remount and take it off again, it, it just isn't really feasible. Um, always focus on the planetary target that you're imaging and use areas of good contrast on those objects. Like, for example, with Mars, you have the dark surface features uh, with Saturn, the Cassini division and the rings. So 
there are features like this, and with practice, you, you get to kind of know when the telescope is, is in proper focus just, just through practice in using that focusing system. And again, taking your time as well, always take your time with focusing as it's very important to, uh, to get the telescope in proper focus. And of course, focusing and poor seeing can be uh, difficult. And I think that's, this is what a lot of people struggle with, particularly if they, uh, it's their first time out and they're trying to take some images and the seeing isn't good, focusing can be quite frustrating. Another device that is increasingly popular these days, and it's definitely one that I would highly recommend getting hold of for UK observers, and that is an atmospheric dispersion corrector. And I'll, I'll explain a bit more about that in a moment. But this small device which goes into the uh, Barlow lens on, on the back of the telescope before the camera, it basically will allow you to get sharper images of the planets when they're very low down in the sky. So this year, Jupiter and Saturn are going to be really low above the horizon from the UK, only around 16 degrees altitude. And using one of these devices will really help you get sharper images than you would otherwise be able to achieve. As I mentioned here, um, you can see the price are typically around $130, so they're not hugely expensive. There are various manufacturers uh, and they work um, really well. Re uh, and as I say, there are various manufacturers uh, that, that produce them now. And dispersion, um, what it does is Basically, Earth's atmosphere acts as a lens. So light from objects uh, as they pass through our atmosphere get uh, dispersed out in, into their constituent spectrum. So a fur the further an object is from the zenith, the worse this effect becomes, and it becomes increasingly bad towards the horizon. So the lower an object is in the sky, the, the more dispersion will affect the detail in the image. And you can see here in these images of Mars, so here with Mars 30 degrees above the horizon, you can see it has this blue and red fringe to, to the planet. And this is the result of dispersion caused by Earth's atmosphere. Now with planets that are really high above the horizon toward the zenith, the dispersion is negligible to non-existent. And you can see you have a nice clean, sharp image. And these images here of Mars as well also illustrate uh, the, uh, the, what, what dispersion is, and that you can see here with this image, it's really blurred, has these horrible red and blue fringes caused by dispersion. Using a corrector, you can see, completely removes that effect, gives you a much sharper image than you would otherwise been able to achieve. So it's well worth uh, looking at atmospheric uh, dispersion correctors. Now, software to run the cameras. Uh, typically the most popular program these days for planetary cameras is Fire Capture. And you can download this free online at this link here. And this piece of software will pretty much run any of the cameras that you would want to use for planetary imaging. And there are lots of different controls the software has. Uh, and this piece of software is by far and away the most popular piece of software uh, worldwide for planetary imaging. Now, just to, just to cover some tips on capturing image sequences using fire capture, and this applies to most cameras. Um, with, with the ASI cameras, we always want to leave the gamma set at the default value of 50. If we don't, um, we can end up with strange artifacts in the data that we won't be able to get rid of in post-processing. Not setting the gain to very low levels um, Again, you can end up with strange artifacts in the images that you won't be able to get rid of in post-processing. The gain should always be around 60 to 70% on the gain meter. For Jupiter, Mars, you, using the fastest frame rate you can with the gain, again, as I mentioned, set around 60 to 70%. So typically, uh, with most systems, you'll be imaging at around 60 to 100 frames per second with, with typical cameras and telescopes. For Saturn, because it is dimmer, has much lower surface brightness, you'll have to use higher gain and capture more data. Uranus and Neptune require near maximum gain of the camera and slow frame rates to capture, because obviously they're, they're very dim and distant. And typically, 
the capture sequences you use, you typically just take repetitive RGB sequences and there's software you can use to actually combine several sets together to, to really smooth out the noise in an image. And I just want to mention the auto align function in fire capture. It's a little checkbox that you can tick. This really helps with focusing the telescope um, as it holds the image perfectly still on screen. So it kind of takes away any wind shake uh, and stuff like that. And it just really helps with focusing. Obviously for processing the raw data, we have uh, these two programs, which are the, the primary programs around, uh, AutoStacker and RegiStacks. Typically AutoStacker we use to stack the frames from the video sequences. So the software will go through, uh, filter out the, the poorer frames, stack the best frames together. With Registacks, you typically um, use that for sharpening the images. Uh, with WinDupos, another piece of software, we use this for something called image derotation, and that allows us to compensate for the rapid rotation of gas giant planets like Jupiter and Saturn. So basically, it allows us to add lots more data into one image, which gives us a better quality result. And of course, Adobe Photoshop um, which we use for all kinds of different post-processing uh, routines. I just want to show a, a live video sequence captured with the C14 telescope. So this is typically what you see in, with, with a fairly large amateur telescope in good seeing conditions. And you can see various features visible on Jupiter's disk, such as the great red spot, other storms and features. And, that, and this is typically what you see during a night when you're capturing images with the telescope. Um, just to mention a bit more about auto stacker uh, and stacking for images, um, you can see here an image of Jupiter, which is ready to be stacked. And what it does, it uses lots of different alignment points across the image. And typically you place the alignment points as you can see illustrated here. So we avoid the edge of the disc. We don't want to place alignment points there. Always keep them inside the edge. And also make sure they're fairly large in size and overlapping each other comfortably. So that's typically a, a correct uh, way of setting the image up to uh, stack correctly. And typically we'll use maybe, you really need to be using at least 1000 frames in an image sequence to get a good quality image that you can post process easily. So here you can see an image that's uh, been through Auto Stacker. This is a raw video, it's been stacked. So this is 2000 frames stacked together. And you can see it's still quite fuzzy in, in detail. But this is really the kind of the, the, the fun part is this is re where you really get to see what you've captured uh, as, you, as you're now going to sharpen the image in Registacks. So you apply the sharpening in Registacks and you can see there's a lot of fine planetary detail hidden within the image just flicking between the two images there. And, and it's all of those things that I talked about earlier that lead up to capturing these sharp images, making sure the telescope's collimated, cooled, uh, waiting for good seeing. Um, another issue that often comes up with planetary imaging is noise. And noise is without doubt one of the most unattractive things that you can see in an image. Uh, and that's this kind of graininess you see in the image, which is a result of either over-processing, um, sharpening the image too heavily, or not adding enough frames together to smooth out the noise. But there are various ways that you can uh, uh, reduce noise in images. And you can see here, just flicking between uh, an image that hasn't had noise reduction applied and one that has, you can see it really makes uh, quite a significant difference to the aesthetic quality of the image. Uh, Registax has a really good noise reduction uh, routine. So if you select the Gaussian wavelet type, um, it allows you to use the denoise function you see here, and you can adjust the amount of denoise you want. Uh, and it actually works really well. You only typically need small amounts on these sliders here, and it will get rid of that graininess that you see, that you saw in the, in the image a couple of slides back. You can also use the Photoshop denoise function, which also works really well. And also another um, separate piece of software called Topaz Denoise, uh, which also works really well for noise reduction. Um, 
But as I say, getting rid of noise is quite important to producing images that actually do look really nice. Now to move on to uh, another issue that obviously really impacts astronomy in general from the UK, and that is the weather. And it's something that you will uh, have to do battle with if, uh, if you want to capture really good images of, of anything. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, the number one limiting factor for high resolution imaging is uh, atmospheric seeing. And that is the turbulence in Earth's atmosphere through the mixing of air of different temperatures. So you can see here in this diagram, star in space, obviously the light waves are completely unaffected. And as soon as they hit our atmosphere, the different densities and temperatures of the air masses distort the wave front. And that's how you end up with blurry images. And it also illustrates here how a larger aperture is much more affected by seeing than a smaller aperture because it's looking through a great deal more air. So uh, with large telescopes, those nights when it will be able to reach its limits will be far fewer in number than they will with a smaller telescope. And you can also see here just why things like adaptive optics and why they put Hubble uh, in orbit and that is to, to escape the deleterious effects of atmospheric seeing. And you can see here with this image with a four meter telescope of Uranus um, with no adaptive optics and it's just basically a blob um, with, with the atmospheric turbulence corrected by the ad adaptive optics. You can see it, it makes an unbelievable difference in the, in the details that are visible. Now, of course, with amateur telescope, we don't have things like adaptive optics, but what, what we do have is ways to understand when good seeing conditions are likely to occur and make the effort to, to get out there and observe when it's likely the atmosphere will be very calm and tranquil, allowing us to get sharp images. And typically, these weather systems that produce good seeing over the UK are high pressure systems like you see here on the weather chart. So anytime you see a big high pressure system moving in over the UK, uh, those are the times to get outside and make the effort to, to try and image and observe the planets. And you can see here another weather chart and this is if the winds high above the surface at the jet stream level, so around 40,000 feet altitude. And typically when these high pressure systems move in, it pushes the jet stream well away, uh, leaving much more stable and tranquil air over the country. And it, as I say, it's those times that you need to get outside and make the effort. Obviously, if you have weather fronts going through, um, you can often have a really clear sky just after a weather front has gone through, typically will be dreadful uh, for planetary observing. So the sky could be crystal clear. You think, wow, what an amazing night, but the seeing conditions will be absolutely atrocious. Um, so it's always those, these nights under high pressures that are quite, can be quite misty with dew. Those are the nights to make the effort to, to try and observe the planets. And this just uh, shows just some of the forecast charts that you can look at the jet stream with. So it, very, very easy to find online. For example, that's, that's one link, and there are many sites that cover uh, weather forecast charts of the jet stream. And you can see here just a, a chart of it, the jet stream flowing across the Atlantic and across southern England. So under that condition, conditions would typically be poor. Uh, there's little point in, in a, trying to observe the planets then. But of course, not all areas in the world are equal when it comes to uh, the weather. And there are some areas in the world where the atmosphere is incredibly tranquil and still pre pretty much as a normal state of affairs. And so you can see here over South America and the Caribbean where there's just no jet stream at all. And here, for example, over Japan in the winter time where the jet stream is pretty much a permanent feature. So the jet stream and, uh, in particular is, is, is a major problem when it comes to high resolution imaging as any time you find the jet stream parked over your location, there's pretty much a 99.9% .9 chance the planetary images will be really bad. But of course, <laughs> if, you, uh, if you want to wait for the perfect night of conditions, to be honest, in, in more than 20 years of observing, I still haven't seen it. So uh, you'll be in for a long wait. 
Now, traveling overseas to observe is, is one thing that people can, uh, can do, and it's one thing that I've done many times over the years to uh, escape my frustrations with the UK climate. Um, these are just some of the places that I've uh, gone for uh, astronomical observing reasons, and particularly um, the island of Barbados down here in the Caribbean, which I've visited many times um, for, for planetary observing. It's a, it's a really, really excellent site for planetary observing. And when it comes to taking telescopes overseas, many people really balk at the idea of doing it. It's like, why, why on earth would you put an expensive telescope on an aeroplane? You know, it could get damaged easily. You know, it, it, it just puts the fear of God into people. So, and it, it's one thing I've done, I should say, many, many times. And really the key to it is investing in the proper transport cases for the equipment. And you can see here in this photo, um, this, is, this was a, one of the trips that I did to Barbados some years back, and it shows the luggage of the C-14 telescope, um, the equatorial mount, cameras, computer, tripod, and all the other bits and pieces. So if you invest in the proper transport cases for the equipment, you shouldn't have any problems. And in many, many trips overseas over the years, um, transporting telescopes, I've never had any of them seriously damaged. So uh, and I firmly believe that's down to investing in, in the proper transport gear. So if you're really serious and you want to, um, to you know, do an overseas trip to observe, um, invest in the proper transport cases. Uh, and this just uh, is an example of one of the cases that I use from JMI in the USA. Uh, it's a really superb uh, case for transporting telescopes. Now, of course, the experience of observing um, somewhere nice and warm at night is, is really very, very different to the observing experience you'll have here, here in the UK, um, as you can see. Um, so for the Car observing in the Caribbean, for example, the nighttime temperature can be 26, 27 degrees Celsius minimum. Um, it, it's a very relaxing and pleasurable experience uh, to observe somewhere like that. But of course, nowhere on Earth is perfect. And you can see us here on uh, Barbados observing. Uh, this was during our Mars opposition. Um, and we had uh, to contend with some tropical downpours, which uh, is rain of the like you've never seen. So while location, well, somewhere like that is, is certainly far better than here in the UK for planetary observing, it's, it's certainly by no means perfect. Of course, when you have a group of astronomers traveling overseas with telescopes, you can end up with a, a site like this. Um, and here we've got a couple of C14 and C11 telescopes. I think there was a six inch refractor in there as well somewhere. Um, but I should say actually all of this equipment actually was transported to the island and back again uh, with, with no damage at all. So again, um, it really speaks volumes for investing in the, in the proper transport equipment. Now, when you actually um, go to somewhere where the scene conditions can be close to perfect, so there's almost zero turbulence in the atmosphere, such as on Barbados at its best. The views of the planets there can be truly incredible. And you can see here this image of Saturn that I shot from the island using my C14 telescope in June 2016, um, under, as I say, almost perfect atmospheric seeing conditions. And you can see some really very fine details visible um, within Saturn's ring system. A uh, small storm system there visible on the planet and the famous uh, northern polar hexagon. And this is an image, uh, a more recent one taken in 2018, so just last year, again, from Barbados in, in, under excellent conditions. Again, you can see many fine details in Saturn's ring system and a, and a bright storm system visible on the planet. Uh, this is an image of Jupiter taken in uh, March 2016. Again, uh, this one was from uh, Barbados using the C14, and you can see here Ganymede and its shadow with Io alongside the planet. And again, another image from that same 
period showing the great red spot. And uh, uh, one from last year using the C14. And this shows Ganymede uh, and Callisto with Ganymede shadow uh, alongside Jupiter. So you can see a, a good illustration of what it's possible to do with uh, a, a large size amateur telescope under near perfect conditions. It, it's quite incredible that, that how far astrophotography has come, particularly planetary photography. Um, it wasn't so many years ago taking images like this from ground-based telescopes where it was completely impossible. Uh, another image from 2018, this shows Io in its shadow in transit. Um, this one's quite uh, interesting as I, you can see Io is actually eclipsing its own shadow and that's because the planet was almost at exact opposition. So the Earth, Sun and Jupiter all exactly in a line in space. Um, just to move on to some different targets, this is Mars, uh, close to its opposition in 2016. Uh, again, these were taken with the 14-inch uh, Celestron. And you can see many details on the Martian surface. We can see here a localised dust storm active. And you can see uh, various clouds visible across the planet. And, the, and of course, the famous dark surface markings. The uh, ice giants, Uranus and Neptune, are also within reach today. Um, it wasn't so long ago, it was uh, really, really difficult to get images of these planets. But since we, we, we've had the cameras we have now, which are really sensitive to the infrared part of the spectrum, which is where you can see details on these planets, um, it's allowed us to start capturing detail on them. And you can see here a couple of the images of Uranus. Um, uh, this was actually taken from here in the UK on a good night back in October 2015. You can see the bright polar region and equatorial band on Uranus there. This is an image of Neptune. Again, this was 2015, taken with the C14. Um, Neptune is actually a very active planet. There's lots of bright storms uh, erupting on it quite frequently. And you can see here one bright storm that amateurs were following, which I managed to capture uh, back then. And you can see the, uh, the moon Triton alongside the planet. And again, this was taken using the 14-inch telescope. But of course, one of, the, one of the really fun targets to start with when it comes to planetary imaging is the moon. And it's something I've revisited time and time again over the years. And you can see here a nice view of the craters Patavius and Humboldt. And we're looking over the lunar limb. Uh, this was uh, taken using, again, using the 14-inch telescope. This is a view of the crater Copernicus, one of the um, most prominent and famous craters on the lunar surface, again using the uh, C14 telescope. And you can also photograph the solar surface using a full aperture solar filter on large amateur telescopes now. And you can see you can actually capture some really fine detail on the solar surface. So you can see here a view of a sunspot and the solar granulation taken using the 14-inch telescope with a full aperture filter. Um, and yeah, it's, it's quite amazing what, what you can do even with solar photography using large amateur telescopes. So for those that are interested in knowing far more about uh, planetary imaging and uh, how to process the data and capturing data and all that kind of stuff, um, you can visit my website here. And I've set up a page here. Uh, where there are loads and loads of tutorial videos on, on planetary imaging that uh, is pr proving popular. And I produced um, some DVDs some years back, but I've tra now transferred all of the material here online, including loads of new material as well. So if you want to know more uh, about image processing and how to do this in detail, uh, that's the place to head. And just to summarize some of the points that I've covered in this talk, a good quality telescope is essential regardless of type. And as I mentioned, choosing something you can use easily and frequently. Um, trust me on that. Uh, it's, it's, it, you don't want to end up with something that's just going to kill your enthusiasm. Um, give the telescope plenty of time to cool down. I, I'm sure I illustrated the importance of telescope cooling and thermal issues. Obviously, collimation, this is something to check regularly. Don't just check it once and then leave it for six months. 
try and get into a habit of checking it regularly. Obviously making the effort when good seeing is likely, so when those big high pressure systems move in over the UK, those are the times to get out there and really make the effort to photograph the planets. Taking your time with image processing and experimenting. Um, there are lots of active groups on social media, on Facebook. Um, so again, experiment with processing. There, there's lots of different ways to, uh, to approach processing data. And of course, although many of the images that I've shown are spectacular to look at, they're also, a lot of them are scientifically useful, particularly the images of, of the planets, which are studied by professional scientists. So uh, I'm always an advocate of submitting your images to organisations such as the British Astronomical Association, which has a very active Jupiter, Mars, Saturn section, and produce detailed reports on the planets. So sending your images to the BAA, ALPO, and you can even submit to the Juno spacecraft mission website. Uh, so th they are using amateur images to help target features on Jupiter. So that's quite an interesting thing to do. So I'm just going to conclude the talk with uh, an animation of Jupiter I produced in 2016. Um, it's probably one of the best that I've ever produced over the last 20 years. Um, and this is composed of lots of images taken over the course of three or four nights on Barbados where, when the scene conditions were excellent. And you can see here um, just a good illustration of what is achievable today with large aperture amateur telescopes when you develop a, uh, a lifelong obsession with it as, uh, as I have. Um, so hopefully it'll inspire some of you to, uh, to get out there and give observing the planets a go. Thank you very much. Just a few questions if anybody's got anything they'd like to ask Daniel. Yeah. Yep. What's the cost of uh, transportation? Amazingly, many of the times that I've taken equipment overseas, I've paid zero excess baggage fees. And it, it really is, seems to be pretty much down to the airline's discretion. Um, but the vast majority of the time that I've been, uh, I've not paid anything. A lot of the equipment that you see actually breaks down into very manageable parts. So it's never really been a, a major problem, to be honest. Is that because you're going first class? No. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately not. <laughs> what about insurance? The main thing I'd be worried about yeah. something like that would be either a baggage handle in the yeah. telescope yeah. or a baggage handle that drops in the telescope um, or throws it. I can understand your concern on that, I can. Uh, I, would, I would say to you that doing or transporting telescope overseas to observe is not without risk. Um, but all I can say is that of all the trips I've done, and there have been many of them over the years, I've never had an issue. So I think that's a, a fairly good endorsement. Um, I think also with uh, one thing that helps is with, that, with, with astronomy equipment, if, if it's in a, in a case, you know, covered in like fragile labels and, and what else, and they're also pretty heavy, they tend not to, I don't think you could easily throw them about. It's not like a lightweight suitcase. So um, that's kind of what I put it down to anyway. Any security issue? Um, no, I've only ever, uh, of all the trips I've done, I've only ever once been called called in on the tannoy um, down to the baggage area to explain what this strange object um, <laughs> in the box was, which was quite interesting actually, as I got to see a, uh, a really fascinating X-ray of uh, the optical tube of the telescope. <laughs> <laughs> but otherwise, no, no, it's, uh, it, it's, they don't really ask many questions, to be honest. I just, I just wondered if you've yeah. got a, a shot between your best shot in from Barbados yeah. and your best shot from the UK, just to give us um, I, don't, I don't know if you can, um, uh, if you remember the image that I showed earlier in the talk um, when I was talking about thermal issues and I showed an image of Jupiter taken at sunset um, and that was taken from here in the UK which is as detailed uh, as these images and, and you can get images as good as, as images as you can from Barbados here at home. It's the, the big difference is, is that with Barbados, such nights occur maybe three or four times a week, 
while in the UK they're maybe three or four times a year. So that, that's the difference. Yeah. 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 That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned adaptive dispersion correction. Yeah. Um, I can see the, the advantage of that with a color camera. Does it make much difference with mono filters? Yeah, um, and particularly with the planets uh, at the altitudes they are in the UK at the moment. So with Jupiter and Saturn, because they're really low in the sky, 16 degrees, which is really low. Even with you know typical RGB filters, you would see some benefit from using a dispersion corrector, even with them. With WinDupos, how long can you get away with before the bank will be rotated? Um, using WinDupos, with Jupiter, typically you can image for around 15 minutes at maximum. Um, I typically go around, I typically, most of my images are, are 10 minute captures. With Saturn, you can get away with maybe 40 minutes, miles an hour. So, you know, using the wind, we're using wind dupos to compensate for rotation makes a, a massive difference to. So just one sequence. Yeah, you. that's right. I'm just capturing one sequence over that time period. Yeah. Um, you didn't mention anything about Barlow lenses. What do okay. you use? Um, on on my scope, I've got a, uh, a Barda two times Barlow system on there, which is actually a modular one, so you can dismantle it and attach it in different ways. Uh, and they're typically, uh, something like a two, three times is plenty because a lot of the cameras that I talked about uh, have quite small pixels. So you don't need really, really long focal lengths. Something like around F20, F30 is, is more than enough. What, what's the best camera to get for that sort of result? Um, most of the, most of the um, images that I've use and the camera that I've used for most of the images that I've shown in the talk are the ASI range of cameras. So typically the ASI um, 174, 120, 290, they do various models um, and well as you can see you know they give great results uh, and they don't cost the earth either. David, yep. when, you, when you process your images what are you used as an acceptance criteria um, to grade the images, what sort of percentage are you, are you using and what are you throwing away? You talk about this gentleman of a, a yeah. break, you know, he's shooting 15 minutes sort of, yeah. sort of suit, yeah. Yeah. many thousands of yeah. views. What are you using as the... T typically um, from an image sequence, so say I take 5,000 frames in one sequence, I will try and use half the sequence in the stack. So typically I use about 50% of the frames. Um, you might think that you would gain some benefit from only using maybe the, the top 10 or 15% of sharpest frames, but the problem is, is that the image isn't sharp enough. Uh, uh, sorry, the image isn't um, uh, noise-free enough to process properly. So the fewer frames you use, the, the more noisy the image is. So typically you need to use at least a couple of thousand frames in a sequence to actually get a signal to noise ratio good enough to be able to process the image reasonably. Our last question. Yeah, okay. Sorry, can I just ask when you're all to stack it, when you're fixing the frames for the fixing point, yeah. are you setting all those by hand? Then? Yeah, yeah, I typically do that manually. But it also, I should mention actually, it also has a function in auto stacker called um, multi-scale. Uh, and if you check that, it will automatically place the alignment points over the image. And that actually works really well. Yeah, yeah. Does that do that? Yes, it does. Yeah, it does. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, one last question. Okay. I just ask you, have you ever been on one of your trips and forgotten anything really important? The reason I say that is if I was doing this, that's yeah. exactly what would happen to me. Yeah, yeah. Um, fortunately, I haven't, no. Um, and I think that's because I've always when I've been getting ready for them, I've always kind of approached it in quite a fastidious way, made a detailed list and checked stuff off as I've packed it away to, to make sure I've packed everything I've needed. So fortunately, I, I've never managed to forget anything crucial uh, on any of them. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. So I think that concludes our talk today. Oh,
Thank you. Speak to Damien at the end. You can come up and. Well, it's just a quick one. Yeah. Is um, is your beautiful animation there uh, available, or is it is it you know? Am I able to see this online? Yeah, yeah. If you go to my website, um, you can uh, you can watch it. Yeah. All right.